up in the morning edition, tourism bookings to the Bahamas looking up. How the Ministry of Education plans to manage the lost time from Hurricane Dorian. And creating blind awareness across this country. Today is the perfect day to start living your dreams. Good morning, everyone. I'm LaDawn Davis, and welcome to the Morning Edition. Thank you so much for waking up with us. We have fair weather on the outside, and for a first look on your weather outlook for the rest of the week, here's Chief Meteorologist Basil Dean. This weather report is sponsored by Bank of the Bahamas, the bank of solutions. Good morning, LaDawn. We woke up to some rather mild temperatures this morning in the low 70s, but right now, taking a look at our ZNS Tower Cam uh, near Clear Skies, just a few clouds floating out there over the capital. And our satellite picture in the tropics, we have the remnants of uh, tropical depression number 15. Right now, showers associated with that moving to the north of the Cape Verde Islands. There's another area of disorganized showers and thunderstorms a few hundred miles to the east of the Lesser Antilles, very low chance of developing. And then we have this frontal boundary across southern Florida that will be heading towards the southeast. We'll tell you all about that later in the newscast, so stay tuned. And the forecast for the system, northwest at about 8 miles per hour, the maximum sustained winds down to about 30 miles per hour. Outside of our studios, just a few clouds, temperature a very cool 70 degrees, relative humidity 93%. We have calm winds, the barometric pressure 1,015.7 millibars, that's 29.99 inches, and the pressure is rising. Temperatures this morning, 74 in Marsh Harbor, Abaco, Grand Toll Key at 74, also Freeport, 74 degrees in the Berry Islands. 79, Alistair, Bimini, 80 degrees, 78 in Harbor Island, Roxanne, Elutra, 78, Alistair, Cat Island at 79, 78 in Stanley Key, Kemp's Bay, South Andros at 78, 76 in Fresh Creek, Central Andros, San Salvador, 79, Rum Key at 79 degrees as we take you into Ragged Island, Clarence, San Long Island, Crooked Island, Betsy Bay, Acklands, and Inagua, all at 81 degrees, the Turks and Caicos Islands at 82 degrees. Your boating forecast for today for all areas, you can expect light and variable winds with very flat sea conditions. Perfect day for boating. High tide, 9 in the morning, low tide at 323 in the afternoon. And that's going to do it for your first look at weather in the morning edition. Stay tuned. Your forecast for today and tonight is still ahead. Basil, thanks a lot. Lloyd Allen is taking in some of the sea breeze along Saunders Beach this morning as he shares roundabout trips, roundabout driving tips with us this morning. The traffic report is sponsored by Bahamas First. First in insurance, today, tomorrow. Well, good morning, LaDawn. Good morning, Bahamas. This morning, LaDawn, before we get started, I have a very special word for you. That word is hotep. It means I greet you in peace and in love. So, of course, this morning, LaDawn, hotep. This morning, I'm greeting you from the scenic area of Western New Providence. This is near Saunders Beach Roundabout. And what I've observed so far this morning, most of the traffic seems to be headed in the eastbound location. However, your southbound and westbound lanes remain available to your various destinations here in the capital. Of course, this morning, I'm joined by Sergeant Jerron Thompson from the Royal Bahamas Police Force, who's giving us a look at overnight traffic. Good morning, Thompson. Good morning to you. Good morning, Bahamas. So what was traffic like overnight? We had a high volume of traffic accidents in the last 24 hours. We had a 30 accidents for the entire country, um, eight of which involves accidents with injuries, and four of which involves hit-and-run accidents. Uh, as I started to talk to you earlier, you know, I've observed that, uh, I, as we've talked over these last few weeks, it, it seems to be a significant amount of hit and runs happening and occurring in the country. But you also talked about uh, a beautiful experience where a bystander was able to capture a video of a similar incident and that led to uh, some action by police. Yeah, sometime last week we had a crash on Blue Hill Road and Carmichael Road in the area of Gears Food Store uh, where a vehicle would have rear-ended another vehicle. The driver would have reversed and took off leaving the scene of that of that crash. Um, from that video, we were able to track that vehicle down. One of our off-duty officers, he saw that vehicle in the downtown area yesterday, Townsville Street. Um, so we're appealing to the driver uh, to come to us before we come to you, because we are going to come to you. And we would like to thank that person who took that video, because it, it, it was a lot of help, 
the truck and all that vehicle. Are you able to describe the vehicle? It's a black Honda Accord. Um, it has some artwork on the right front fender panel. All right. Uh, now, of course, uh, great information there. I, too, am a victim of a hit and run. Uh, it happened to me a few months back. I was driving on uh, Tonic Williams Highway heading in the eastbound location. Someone hit me, pulled off. I reported it to the uh, Grove Police Station, and they told me that apparently that same vehicle may have been involved in a robbery at the time as well. So, of course, many of these incidents are linked. So, of course, as uh, Officer Thompson is saying, if you do observe any incidents like this happening in the public, please take those videos and send those to the police so they can assist in those investigations. But, of course, traffic continues in this area to flow beautifully. And, uh, of course, uh, we're reporting to you on a beautiful Tuesday, Wednesday morning, here in southern in western New Providence. Ladon, back to you in studio. Some great tips there, Lloyd. Thanks a lot. Now on to our top story this morning. Hurricane Dorian left a mark on the country, but the number one industry is still holding strong. Director General of Tourism Joy Gerbalu says during the first two weeks of September, arrivals to the Bahamas showed a decline by 19 percent. Gerbalu says some hotel properties have indicated that tourists have expressed their reluctance to be seen or be seen rather having fun in a country where some residents are suffering. Now, despite the drop early in the month, the Tourism Director General says there is an indication of a rebound. As of mid-September, the outlook for forward bookings for September through November was actually, unsurprisingly, slightly ahead of last year's trend, even if only by 1%. And the outlook through February was ahead by 2.7%, while airlift capacity was expected to continue to increase. American Airlines has reported to us that their December bookings are up 10% year on year, year on year. And so we do see a light at the end of the tunnel for those in the tourism sector. Over in Abaco, there is a glimmer of hope as the port in Marsh Harbor is expected to be back in operation today. Also, the Department of Environmental Health will start removing debris from residential areas. Those residents who have started to clean their properties are being advised to ensure that all garbage is placed at the roadside without blocking the main roadway. Work is also underway to begin the process to reopen the Marsh Harbor International Airport. Meanwhile, Minister of Education, the Honorable Jeffrey Lloyd, says now that the registration process is complete for students impacted by Hurricane Dorian, they have a better idea of those that still need to be placed in the system. Mr. Lloyd was the guest speaker at the Rotary Club of New Providence last evening. He spoke about education post-Hurricane Dorian and addressed consideration for students who have missed five weeks of classes. We have 150 students now who are not in school because they have not been registered with the National Insurance Board. So we are making a decision, a policy decision, as to how they are to be treated. Question about it, certainly a longer school day for those students, longer uh, school week in terms of our possible Saturday and holiday uh, classes, as well as, you know, um, uh, some adjustment made in our vacation time. I mean, there's just no way around it. You know, you know these students have to have the requisite number of hours, I want to say days, in order for them to be able to meet and fulfill and complete the curriculum. And if you're five weeks short, that is already 25 days out of 180 days. You've got to make it up. And uh, I, I think we can. The education minister says the focus now is to ensure that all students displaced by Hurricane Dorian are placed in a school. Uh, two schools, Maurice Moore and Hugh Campbell will not be ready until Monday the 21st. We are, of course, challenged with the school's situation in Abaco, Central Abaco, and that is why approximately 1,400 students have been placed in schools in New Providence and another six or 700 in schools in other parts of the Bahamas. So we are working to ensure that every student who has been displaced in Grand Bahama or in Abaco Every student is in some school settings, and we are working with our principals in those various islands to give us a population count, a census as to which students you have from those islands so that we can know where all our students are. 2,295 were enrolled in Abaco at our last census. 
With students on Grand Bahama and Abaco set to get a late start to the 2019 academic year, Director of Education Marcellus Taylor says officials will have to determine ways to make up for the lost time in the classroom. However, he says it is unlikely that it will include an extension of the academic year. Taylor says taking national examinations into consideration may pose a challenge, but a decision will be made once classes resume. With national exams, there are some other things that are tied into that, students going to universities and all that uh, sort of thing. So we may not be able to do much in terms of pushing the time down. But I think um, we want to use a, a common sense approach to this. So we are here in New Providence. We are not affected by it to that extent. So uh, for us, it will be engaging the local uh, Grand Bahamian uh, education sector. We're trying to understand what are the things that we can do to maximize the instructional time. So um, we don't know if it will involve the extension of the uh, school uh, year at this point. I'm, I'm not really confident that that would be a strategy that people are going to opt for. It may involve some Saturday uh, uh, tuition and some uh, extended school days. Meantime, the Catholic Education Board doing its part to assist teachers and students displaced by the hurricane. The Morning Edition team sat down with the Director of Catholic Education for an update on their rebuilding efforts. We had to send a private charter to have them come here. About 14 displaced teachers and their families are housed here at the St. Augustine's Monastery. Director of Catholic Education Claudette Roll gave us an update on their status since Hurricane Dorian. We had them in St. Martin for two weeks while we were getting St. Augustine's Monastery ready to house them. Getting St. Augustine's Monastery ready wasn't easy, but thankfully we had so many benefactors and our colleagues, our Catholic community. Now the monastery was designed for monks, so you're talking about very austere type of living arrangements, and it's communal living. And we thought initially that it would be a challenge with communal living, but they have worked together so well. We assigned a house mother who has the responsibility for helping them with scheduling the cooking of meals, the washing, they take care of their own cleaning. Roll says one of the biggest concerns for the displaced is price gouging for temporary housing. Trying to find apartments, it's not very easy, particularly when you're looking at areas where transportation is also a, a general need, it's, it's not easy. Um, and there's a lot of, of prices going up. Um, you know, you, you, you identify a spot today and it's one price and then you follow up tomorrow and it's another price. And so it, that has been very difficult. But just because there are so many persons who are in need, just trying to find housing we know has been a challenge. And so we're hoping that by December 31st, most of them, or all of them, who are at the monastery would be able to transition out of there. Roll revealed to ZNS News that Mary Star of the Sea opened on the 17th of September and its primary school opened on the 23rd. The Catholic Education Director says students and teachers in the Catholic schools have endured a lot during Hurricane Dorian, losing their homes and other personal belongings. However, she said it was only fitting for the diocese to make the restoration and rebuilding process as comfortable as possible. We had 25 teachers, two administrators, um, from one school, we had 14 teachers, two administrators from another school in Abaco. Um, and so they were all displaced. Some of them are here, most of them are here. Some of them have chosen to go back to their home countries, whether it's Canada, the US, Guyana, Jamaica, and um, so the rest of them are here. We have, between the two schools, we had 400 students who were displaced. We have 170 of those students in our Catholic board schools. We have 19 students in St. Augustine's College. And um, the other students have either gone to, a lot of them have gone to the U.S. We lost one teacher, um, Alicia Leoli, from Every Child Counts, and her two children. And so that was very, very difficult for us. Rose says the Catholic community's main priority is to continue practicing discipleship to assist those in need. 
And still to come, the white cane and what it means for the blind community, we've got the answer on the other side of the break. Welcome back to the Morning Edition. Over in Grand Bahama, teachers and administrators are returning to the classrooms today aware of the loss of time and the impact it could have on students preparing for examinations. One teacher found a way to give her students a head start. Chamila Mizik reports. Autumn Wild Goose is a sixth grade teacher at the Hugh Campbell Primary School and has been an educator for the past 17 years. She now works with students that have mixed abilities from those who are average to students that have exceptionalities, such as autism. But with the threat of Hurricane Dorian delaying the opening of school, without having to give it much thought, her passion for teaching prompted her to find another way to teach her students because she says she knew there was no time to waste. I wanted to get a head start. I know that um, we were going to be out for a little while, considering the situation with the hurricane. And so, um, it just, I got the idea to uh, um, begin working earlier once I saw this place available. I usually work here and help and assist with music school in the afternoon. And so when the school opened last week or the week before, I asked Ms. Ms. Murphy, the owner of the establishment, if I could use the spot in the morning to work with my students so that we could get that head start. And so I have my students, but I have one or two students from other schools that are also part of the program. But it's a sixth grade class, and we already start working with the curriculum. She says although it is still uncertain when the Hugh Campbell Primary School, one of the schools severely impacted by the storm, will reopen, she's ready to return to the classroom. got some notification that it may be up and running next week. Um, I'm not sure, you know, everything isn't written in stone, but... Um, I'm looking forward to next week going back to the classroom. There are one or two students that I couldn't get in touch with. So it would be good if we get back in so that all the students would be together. Now the classes are held from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And Autumn says she's focusing on mathematics, reading, social studies, and science because they are critical GLAD examination subjects for the sixth graders, noting that the students are enjoying the classes and are doing very well. Jamila Mizek, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Jamila. The Nassau Christian Academy on Soldier Road has changed its name to the Nassau Christian Schools. The private institution has an enrollment of nearly 1,500 students and has made a positive impact on the lives of thousands of productive and top influential Bahamians. Administrative Assistant Renee Mills shared with us the reasons behind the change. We've always been known as Nassau Christian Academy because, as you know, we would have started um, with the We Wisdom um, School, and then we kept adding and adding. And because we moved the We Wisdom campus on, uh, to our Soldier Road campus, We Wisdom used to be on Collins Avenue, we moved it to our Soldier Road campus, we decided to put all of the schools under one umbrella. So instead of Nassau Christian Academy, we are now Nassau Christian Schools, three schools on one campus. Students in the private and public schools are taking full advantage of speaking Spanish as a second language in and out of the classroom. And this is evident by the positive examination results the students have achieved over the years. Bianca Brown, 7th and 8th grade Spanish teacher at the Nassau Christian School, says she is happy to be one of many teachers able to give the students the boost they need to speak and read the language fluently. The seventh graders, I'll be honest, they are extremely excited. At first, I was a little bit, you know, timid as to, okay, how would they receive the, you know, the language and how would they be open to it, but the results are amazing. And I'm excited to be able to introduce another language to our students because I can tell you it is very beneficial. We now in the Bahamas have a very diverse population. And so I'm encouraging them, I'm encouraging them to just you know, keep up the good work and just be excited about their results. While scores of students and advocates for the visually impaired met in Rawson Square yesterday to commemorate the international day known as White Cane Day, 
White Cane Day, which follows World Sight Day, celebrates and raises awareness for the probing cane, an essential tool known for its red and white color, which aids the visually impaired in independent travel. We spoke to School for the Blind Principal Charlene Murphy on the importance of the day and the white cane. The public needs to know that whenever they see a person with the white cane, they need to respect them. Uh, what we're doing, we have um, a program at the school called Mobility. What, we, what we're doing is um, trying to train them to be independent, to go into the banks by themselves, to walk the streets by themselves, um, to whatever recreation that they can go and move by themselves. And so we want the public to be aware of the white cane. When they see a white cane, a person with a white cane coming, they move on the side, they help them along, and they respect them. And I think they deserve the respect. The blind people in the society, they are important. Nearly 20 years ago, Sheila Smith got unwelcome news no woman wants to hear when she learned she had breast cancer. At the time, she says the news was devastating. She shares her story with Cleopatra Murphy. 60-year-old breast cancer survivor Sheila Smith smiles with her youngest daughter today because she beat breast cancer 19 years ago. In September 2000, she was diagnosed with stage 2 and a half breast cancer. The most I remember about it was the shock of the whole thing. And I think the minute I heard it, everything just started rolling in. And I started moving really fast. I would call it almost recklessly. Smith says she visited a surgeon that same day to schedule a radical mastectomy that was performed a week later. She later learned that she did not need to take the extreme measure, but explained her mindset. All I was thinking was, live, live, live. If I have to move that, if I move both of them, if I move my legs, do what I need to do to make sure I'm, sure I'm here for my children. So that was an easy decision. I definitely probably would not have gone with a lumpectomy because I still feel like it's important to get it all out, so uh, who knows. Smith explained that chemotherapy was administered six weeks after surgery, marking a new round of anxiety. But it was really rather scary, I must say. The very first one, I cried. I did when I saw the bag of drugs, I cried. But after that, it was easy. She endured nausea, loss of appetite and hair loss that was a traumatic experience. I was just washing my hair one night. And, you know, it just came out of my hands. I was like, oh my gosh, it has started. And the first time it just comes off very, very sparse. And then I immediately got it shaved because it was time to like, I don't want to see this every day. Smith says since she went into remission in January 2001 and got a new lease on life, she's sure to undergo examination annually and has adopted a new healthier lifestyle. She also joined a support group. One person in particular, Jenny Dean, I'm a part of her cancer support group right now. She's now deceased, but I continue to support the group because it's a beautiful bunch of women who are really interested in living, loving, and laughing. Smith is now urging women to pray about it when they are diagnosed and learn as much as they can. She says the positivity that she has embraced makes a huge difference. Cleopatra Murphy, Sadness Network News. Great story there, Cleo. And still to come, how to avoid getting a ticket if you decide to pick up that cell phone while on the street. That and more straight ahead. A major resort is stepping up in a unique way to assist those persons impacted by Hurricane Dorian. Lloyd Allen joins us live. Well, good morning again, LaDawn. This morning, we're here at the Bahamar Academy. This organization, Bahamar, has done in a significant way following the passing of Hurricane Dorian, contributed and pledged to assist those in need. Already, the company has pledged $2 million and is looking at those efforts to assist New Providence residents think that beyond the storm. This morning, I have Executive Director for the Bahamar Resort Foundation, Mr. Robert Sandy Sands, giving us some more insight on how the organization is impacting those impacted from the storm. Good morning, Mr. Sands. Good morning, Bahamas. All right, so tell us about your efforts here at the uh, resort. Well, as you mentioned, we have pledged $2 million. More importantly, we made our first donation of half a million dollars uh, to the Bahamas 
Relief Fund. We made that donation to the Prime Minister last week. We have initiated Pack with Love, which caused many of our guests to travel with items to the Bahamas, which we have been able to distribute over 100 packages to various entities such as the Bahamas Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the Nazareth Center. Many packages have gone to Grand Bahama Island. We've also, we've also partnered mm -hmm. with, with Hands for Hunger, where we helped with the feeding of many of the evacuees and volunteers here in the Bahamas. But perhaps one of the highlights of our support through this foundation has been movie nights for the evacuees at the Kendall G. Isaacs Gym. And we are very encouraged by our, the sense of community of our guests, of our associates, and the support that the Bahama Foundation has contributed to this relief effort. And speaking about the sense of community, uh, you spoke earlier about an experience of, with, uh, I think, a wedding party that came into the hotel? That is correct. Tell me about that. So, Packing with Love. Uh, one of the, uh, the groups was a large wedding party that came to the Bahama for their wedding, and each of the bridesmaids and their guests came with one or two suitcases of brand new clothing, principally for children, teenagers, etc., which we were able to donate to persons in need as a result of this hurricane. This Pack with Love program has been enormously successful, and it gave us the idea to go on to not only support those from the hurricane, but also those throughout the community here in the Bahamas. Well, some great information there, and as we learned about that, uh, the organization, as you said, grew from there, uh, and as it grew from there, it also grew to assisting a closet for professionals. Think about that. So uh, give me your name. Uh, you work in human resources here. Give me your name and tell me about this project. So my name is Martista, and yes, yeah, so here as the HR team, a part of our shared services brand, um, we wanted to find the most practical way to respond to our uh, fellow, fellow family members across the Bahamas that have been affected by the storm. And being a part of the HR team, we knew that what people were going to need, these people that were located on Grand Bahama and Abaco who had been in careers for a number of years and were starting over, they were going to need assistance with getting back into stable work and meaningful work. And the, one of the ways that we were able to assist firstly was in September 17th, 19th, and the 20th, we hosted uh, developmental workshops. So professional workshops to assist with coaching on interviewing, resumes, just getting people back out there. Um, one of the things that we realized through the Pack With Love campaign as we sorted through those items is we were having a number of professional articles of clothing that were being donated, and now we're over 300 donations. So what we decided to do was originally uh, we were giving these items uh, away to our participants of our workshops, but now we saw the need and we've seen the overflow of items that have been donated, and we decided to open it up to the wider public. So uh, that's some great information. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm sort of like mixed mix match this morning. Uh, so I, I imagine I might even find a few pieces in here this morning. But uh, uh, walk me through uh, what's available. So what we have available is brand new as well as like new items that have been donated. So we're talking about shirts for men, women, skirts, pants, full suits, um, we're, we're talking an, a very wide array of items. And so those who participate this Saturday, October 19th, between the hours of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., will be able to go home with up to two items as well as accessories. So you know Bahamians, we always like to see things. So come on, take, take one or two of, uh, of, of the pieces out. Let's see what's uh, happening here. One of the things that I think will definitely excite persons is as you know, we are a luxury resort, so with our type of clientele, the donations that are coming in, this is a very, as you can imagine, this is a Gucci blouse. Oh. So we, we are definitely, we're giving the highest quality, and we want everyone to be prepared and feel confident when they're going out and finding, um, finding their new start, their fresh yeah. start. So we're very excited. Great news there, and of course... Um seems like the employees and those coming out to uh, uh, get a handle on what's happening here, you'll have it made. Uh, so reporting here from Bahama Academy this morning with my new friend. <laughs> Give me your name again. Martista. Martista. LaDon, back to you in studio.
Thanks a lot, Lloyd. Well, as you hit the streets this morning and are tempted to pick up those cell phones, you must remember those new traffic rules that will prohibit you from using your cell phones without the proper device. Lloyd Allen reports. So it's just over a week since the new traffic law prohibits drivers from using handheld devices while on the streets. But there is a route right behind that law. You can use Bluetooth devices to continue on with your daily activities. We visited Games and More to find out a bit more about how Bluetooth devices work. Games and More is one local store like many, which specializes in a number of electronics, games, and other tech gear. Cashier Dior Forbes says the store has recently been inundated by motorists eager to upgrade road gear and remain on the right side of the law following the new road safety requirements. Forbes says walk-ins have increased overnight, with many people inquiring about the ins and outs of wireless communication devices, namely Bluetooth tech. Yes, sir, a lot, a lot of people. Um, how does it work? you know, questions like that. And if they have to use their hand at all to, you know, to work as they try to not break the law. Forbes says Bluetooth devices range from earbuds to FM transmitters and even smart watches. She also provided this display and demonstration of a number of products now on the market. And this one is the FM transmitter, the Bluetooth FM transmitter. This is easy to push into the cigarette lighter. It also comes with a charger too, charging boards. This here is the smart watch. Pull it down here so you could connect it to your phone and you could just answer the call from there. This design, a little different. This is the airpiece. You could do it around your neck. And then it's also the volume up, down, power button. Pull this down to pair it. And it also comes with the extra airpieces and then the charging cable. Deshante Davis also shared some insight on these devices. First, this is a car wireless charger. You could just put it like in the car vent and then you could put your phone in it instead of like having your phone in your lap or putting it to your ears. Like, and then you could just like when you're getting a call, like just press it and then you are able to talk and instead of having it in your hand. We have this, this is the i11. Um, you, put, you put it, you connect it to your phone and then it allows you to, it goes in your ass. And so it's like a sensor also, it's like rub your hand across here. So that helps it to like turn on. Then there are the prices. These right here, these right here are 50, 40, and this one is 39, 20. All in all, a Bluetooth upgrade may set you back anywhere from 30 bucks all the way up to $150, depending on your preference. But regardless of the type of device, the upgrade will definitely save you much more than a traffic ticket. And that's a look at your business tidbit for this week. Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd Fisher. You seem to have been having a great time over there yeah, in I'm Dutra. back from your homeland, but I like this new law, LaDonna. When I see the phone ringing nowadays and I see my wife's numbers coming up, that gives me good excuse not to answer. So when I reach home, I tell I can't answer you because the phone is ringing in the car. So that's a good excuse. You know, Basil? That, so we, we have a good reason now not to answer our wives while the, while the phone is ringing in the car. Okay, okay, okay. I don't agree with you, Fisher. I don't agree with you. What's coming up in sports? What's coming up in sports? We're going to show you some highlights of that fishing tournament over there in Eleuther. And then also last night, game twos of the New Providence Softball Association Championship. You need to go back more often a lot of folks are asking for you great stay with us sports is up next <laughs> Good morning once again. Game twos of the New Providence Softball Association Best of Seven Championships last night at the Blues Field. Let's start first with the men. It was a pitcher's deal between Alcott Forbes and Thomas Davis, but it was Davis and the Commander Security Truckers. Evening this series with the CS Enterprise Hitman at a game apiece, they won 4-3. Move now to the ladies and down one zip to the Sunshine Auto Wildcats. The inventive intellect Lady Warriors came out swinging and led 9-3 heading into the fifth. But you know you never back a cat into a corner as they come out clawing and erupted for nine runs in the fifth, two in the sixth and five in the seventh and go on to take a commanding two zip lead with a 2012 come from behind win. Tyrese Curry going three for four, scored two runs and two RBI. 
Dyer came as one for three with three runs scored. I'm very proud of my team. Um, we started off a little flat, but we didn't get down. Uh, we continue to play good defense. Um, we know our offense is going to come around, so that's what we did. Uh, we stayed resilient, which is good, and I'm very proud of what we did. At what point in the game you say, you know what, we're not going to go down and tie the series 1-1, one, one. we're going to go up 2-0? Um, like in the top of the fourth. I mean, we worked very hard, even though we were down, but we were never out. We know that if we continue to stay together, continue to play good softball, that we were going to get back into it, and that's what we did. You know, I keep on them. I said, those runs in the head, can't, they can't keep a stand. They can't hold a lead. All right? If you keep fighting it, we'll get finally we'll get back there. You know what I mean, you can't give up on yourself. You make some mistakes, just suck it up, and let's go ahead. As a manager, to make some lineup adjustments. Yeah, you know, some... Uh, one or two players came in late, so I just use what I have, you know, but everybody can play. Uh, we just got to finish at the end of the game. We started off strong, we just fall short on the finish. Government School Sports Canada finally getting underway Tuesday with volleyball at the Donald Davis Gym in Junior Girls Play. The Royals of CA Reeves getting off to a good start, 17, 10 and 15 over Anatole Rogers, Timberwolves. Today is the beginning of uh, volleyball season and we're very happy to know that our girls uh, came through with a victory. Uh, most of my girls are very young, 7 and 8 graders, a few seniors who are helping the team along and uh, it's a rebuilding year for us. Um, they were a little shaky in the game and we, we pray that God will continue to give them that confidence booster that when they play the other games that they will do quite well. But we, we're very happy with the first win today as the season opener. And just back from Eleuthera where they were pulling the fishes out of the water by the dozens, cooler full, and the boat, you will never go hungry taking the top honor. And the boys on the boat had fished for days, Basil. Good weather and everything. You see those big Margaret fish, they are pulling out the coolest. My cameraman Randy knows brought back a cooler for everybody in Zedness, and they are happy that they did it this year. Oh, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. And the ride was gorgeous. We pulled together. We hold up each other. We did things the right way. Oh, the drop, the drop was awesome. Like, like every drop we went to is like spanking. Weep, weep. And now all we just do it. Thank God for Captain and the mate, you know, and we all together, we did, we did it. Boss lady, she's the jump lady, you know, she, she did it right. So, bang. When we came in, we thought that we didn't have enough. We wanted to stay and fish some more, but uh, when we saw the boats come in and the dejected look on their faces, we knew that something was up. We won this fishing tournament outright. They may say that we sort of cheated, but that's not true. They said we bought fish pots, but that's not true. <laughs> we won fair and square, and we are the champions until the next fishing tournament next year, Lodge Illusion Adventures. I think it's our second year fishing together, and we they chipped robbers last year. We came back for redemption, and we did it handily. They stopped counting at uh, 145, yeah. and they said, you know what, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and we ended up with 250 something. So the numbers, the numbers spoke for themselves. Yeah. Six crew members compared to 15. Outright. Yeah. With our eagle claws and our, our um, number twenty, num, uh, number nine hooks and things like that, we went out on the drops and we did pretty good. Bringing some yellow tails, bringing some dragons and some good-looking fish, some snappers. So we will be f having some fry fish tonight. Thanks to the boat captain and our crew, we did it. Number one. Fresh, fresh. That's gonna do it for sports. But before we get out of here, good news coming out of Grand Bahama, where they are set to start their sports calendar. This coming Monday with volleyball in the high school. That's it for sports. Thanks for watching, everybody. In our final look at whether the remnants of TD number 15 remains uh, just to the north of the Cape Verde Islands and it's moving towards the uh, northwest at about 8 miles per hour, we have another area of uh, disturbed weather. It's somewhat disorganized, so several hundred miles to the east of the Les Adelaide has a very low chance of development, so we're not overly concerned about that. This is, uh, and then we have this frontal boundary across the southern portion of the United States. This will advance towards the south and east will bring some showers and clouds into 
to the extreme northwest Bahamas by the weekend, so we can see some showers working their way into our forecast over the weekend. But until then, high pressure will remain in control of our weather, and that means very light winds, uh, lots of sunshine during the daytime, and some mild uh, nighttime uh, temperatures. Uh, and then we look at our graphic here for TD number 15, or what's left of TD number 15. As you can see, it's moving well to the north of the Cape Verde Islands, and uh, the showers associated with that now clipping the eastern portion of uh, those islands will remain over the open waters of the Atlantic. We'll encounter some uh, hostile wind conditions just ahead of that, and perhaps this will uh, whistle out to just a ordinary low pressure over the next uh, couple of days. Our forecast uh, for today calls for pleasant conditions with intervals of clouds and sunshine, the high temperature getting up to 87 degrees, and tonight it's going to be near clear skies again with very mild temperatures down to about 75 degrees, and perhaps could drop a little, a uh, couple of degrees or lower than that 75 as well. Out the seven day forecast shaping up like this pretty nice right into Friday, but by Friday night, the clouds will start rolling in as that frontal boundary gets a little closer. On Saturday, look for lots of cloudiness with showers in the forecast, but things just start drying out quite nicely on Sunday as we head into the early part of next week. Lots of sunshine working its way back into our forecast. Ladon. Thanks a lot, Basil, and that does it for us this morning. On behalf of the entire Morning Edition team, I'm LaDawn Davis. Make it a great Wednesday, everyone.